digital heroin, spiritual opium, social brain damage, the contamination of spiritual civilization. These are all terms that the Chinese government and its agencies have used to describe video games over the decades, and they have distrusted the medium already from their earliest encounters with it in the 1980s. Imported Japanese game consoles were the country's first real touchpoint with the world of gaming, and the country's leadership instantly treated those with hostility, slapping massive 130% import duties on them to keep them out. Imported foreign rot infecting the minds of Chinese citizens is what these were declared to be. And ever since those early Japanese imports, the country has been on a veritable warpath against video games that by now has turned into the world's strictest gaming laws by far, with mandatory facial recognition in games, countrywide bans on new game releases, and a whole lot more. So, why is China so uniquely obsessed with regulating video games, and have their attempts to rein this industry in actually worked? This video was sponsored by Nebula, where we now have lifetime memberships. More info at the end of the video. In 2018, the World Health Organization, for the first time ever, classified video game addiction as an officially recognized disorder and added it to its international classification of diseases. While experts around the world have still not uniformly agreed about this classification, the Chinese government made their decision clear more than a decade earlier already. In 2008, right as modern smartphones were just starting to hit the market, the country's leadership had already declared internet addiction as a clinical disorder, which it overwhelmingly blamed on video games. China got worried way earlier than other countries because its citizens started to get obsessed with their screens way earlier than those from other countries too. In 2002, after four miners burned down an internet cafe in Beijing and killed 25 people in the process due to being denied entry, Chinese public sentiment turned against gaming in a major way. Similar reports of people dying while gaming or hurting others that kept them from their games kept circulating in the news, and by 2007, a government report claimed that 6% of the country's teenage population were spending more than 40 hours a week online, mostly playing games. And gaming actually continued to grow massively up until today across every conceivable metric, from player counts to money spent as well. Today, China is by far the largest gaming market in the world by just about every metric. It is home to the largest gaming companies in the world, it has the largest population of gamers at more than 650 million people, or about half its whole population playing regularly, and spending on games at more than $45 billion a year is also the highest in the world too. China has been the world's largest gaming market for 7 years in a row now. Chinese gamers play longer at 12.4 hours a week versus the 7.7 .7 hours of their American counterparts, and they spend proportionally way more of their wealth on gaming than people in most of the rest of the world too. The Chinese government blames a massive increase in myopia, or nearsightedness, in large part on people staring at their screens for too long while gaming, and the government has a long laundry list of negative social impacts that it also blames on the industry. The numbers make it clear that a lot of Chinese people are obsessed with playing games, and in a country that has placed a lot of emphasis in the past on productivity and social order, for example, it is perhaps unsurprising that they spent a lot of effort trying to rein this habit in. So in the past, the Chinese government has tried a lot of things, none of which worked particularly well. First was the massive up to 130% import duties that were slapped on imported gaming items that we've already mentioned in the beginning. This failed because black and grey market channels quickly popped up and China built a whole cottage industry of clones. If you have seen my previous video on the Chinese phone giant BBK, they got their start making the Xiaobaowang, which was a Nintendo clone that they cleverly marketed as a learning computer to get past parents and regulators, and there were dozens like them throughout the country. If anything, import duties actually ironically created many of the domestic gaming companies that now dominate the country. Next, from 2000, China outright banned not just the import, but also the local production and sale of video game consoles and arcade machines at a time when those were the primary machines that people gamed on, and the government kept this ban up for 15 years, with a few small exceptions. But perhaps unsurprisingly, this console ban backfired too. 
First, PC gaming and then mobile gaming simply filled the gap that was left by the lack of consoles, making the ban basically ineffective, and even worse, the ban actually created a major economic dilemma. While on official consoles, game developers could reliably make money from selling games outright, China was quickly turning into a mess of black and grey market internet cafes that were dominated by pirated games. In this environment, the only working business model for game companies became first, subscription based games like World of Warcraft, and eventually freemium games that were monetized through things like loot boxes, where gamers basically gamble real money to win items or to progress in-game. In other words, the Chinese gaming industry went all in on the most addictive types of games that there are. Even today, an astonishing 91 of the top 100 games in the country still come with loot boxes, despite the country having since passed laws trying to rein them in. Ouch. Next, in 2007, with a different approach, a new law was passed that specifically tried to add anti-addiction features into games for minors. This worked by first requiring many online games to ask users for their real personal ID numbers to verify their age, which has since become a common practice for all sorts of online activities in China. And then the game developers were supposed to identify minors and punish them after three hours of continuous gaming by halving whatever scores that they had collected by then, and then wiping the their scores completely after five hours. Of course, all of this just started a cat and mouse game where the miners would use the IDs of their parents to sign up, or they would find games where the score system didn't really matter, or they just play multiple games so they never reached the maximum in any of the single games, etc. So the rules basically proved inefficient. Now, beside the multiple attempts from the government, parents naturally also tried taking matters into their own hands. Already by 2009, more than 300 internet and video game addiction clinics have sprung up across the country, where supposedly addicted kids could be dropped off to be cured. A few of these were run by the government in a sort of systematic manner, but the vast majority of them were run by private, for-profit companies, and as one might expect, their methodologies and their results were just all over the place. From relatively harmless, well-meaning boot camps to basically private prisons with cases of force-fed psychiatric medication, electroshock therapy, and even beatings that caused the death of at least one child and caused another teen to starve their own mother to death in fury over the brutal boot camp that they were sent to, there's clearly a lot that can and did go wrong in these institutions. Now, camps to fight addiction like these exist outside of China too, and reliable statistics are hard to come by, but it's pretty clear that a network of of privately run prisons for minors with no scientific theory of a cure and no real oversight is definitely not an adequate solution to a supposedly systemic problem, and the Chinese government has raided multiple of these institutions since. All of which is to say that the country has tried a lot of different things, and even though it's impossible to say what the country would have looked like without trying these things, one can pretty confidently claim that none of them have worked as a sort of miracle solution. And I think there are two main reasons for this. On the one hand, fixing any complicated issue with regulation is just extremely hard, as both gamers and companies have often simply outsmarted the attempts of the people who tried to rein them in in the past. But on the other, I also think that gaming was becoming an extremely lucrative business and the government had a hard time going all in on regulating it in the past. From the gaming giant Tencent, which is China's most valuable private company and which owns what feels like half the modern gaming world around the globe by now, to NetEase, which is worth a staggering $66 billion, or as much as Microsoft paid for Activision Blizzard, or even smaller independent successes like Genshin Impact, China has found huge economic and even cultural success in gaming. Not only do Chinese companies completely dominate their domestic markets, by now they own almost a quarter of the gaming business in the world outside of China as well. Gaming has clearly become one of the most lucrative businesses of China, and so they've been reluctant to crack down on it too hard in the past. But all of that started to change in the last few years. First, in 2019, the government limited anyone under 18 to only be allowed to play video games for 19 minutes on weekdays and 3 hours on weekends. Then, two years later, they dropped weekday play completely and they shortened weekend sessions to a single, fixed 60-minute time slot per day. That is an incredibly restrictive timetable, and beside that, new laws also added monthly spending limits for minors that range from roughly $25 to $50 a month. 
and to make sure about the enforcement of the new rules, the government this time also built its own real name verification system that it mandated companies implement into their games. This system included not just verifying personal IDs, but on mobile games typically also facial recognition to catch violators. And to prove that this time they were really serious about the implementation, they also beat their gaming companies into submission. For four full years, the release of new video games was severely limited in the country, and between August of 2021 and March of 2022, not a single game was allowed to be released at all, while the party also constantly and publicly berated its game industry for poisoning the nation's youth. This is an actual governing strategy in China where the party will actively and very publicly strangle an industry to make sure that everybody understands that they're super serious about something. Unsurprisingly, 200 Chinese game companies signed statements soon after saying that they would enforce the new rules strictly and they rolled out all the controls that they were ordered to. So these new restrictions actually seem very serious now. And the next question is whether they've actually worked. And we have two different sources claiming that, yeah, actually they have. First, a big study by China's official gaming industry association, which claims that more than 75% of minors now play less than three hours a week, meaning that they fully comply with the regulations, while the amount of minors playing six hours or more is negligent. So the association declared gaming addiction as basically solved among minors. Parents in the study have also reported that their kids secretly paying for in-game items behind their backs has dropped from 29% to 15%, and 86% of the affected parents report being satisfied with the overall effect of these new rules on minors. Meanwhile, the study also claims that enforcement has become much more thorough, with 50 of the top 50 companies now including ID verification, 47 offering clear parental controls, and 20 including facial recognition for detecting minors. Interestingly, the study also also claims that more than 35% of parents also admitted to allowing their kids to circumvent the law by using their IDs, but beside that, the report basically speaks of a complete success. And the other party declaring unanimous victory is of course the Chinese gaming companies themselves. Tencent, for example, reported that total playing time for minors was down 88% year on year on their games, meaning that young people accounted for just 0.9% of time spent on the firm's domestic titles, and other rival firms have made similar claims too. So that sounds impressive, but of course the problem is that all of this is very hard to verify. Both gaming companies and industry associations are extremely incentivized to say that they've totally solved all the problems and everything is running perfectly. Parents are not incentivized to report that they're helping their kids break the law that was just passed. And of course, kids are not incentivized to let anyone know when they're circumventing any of these systems. So take this with lots of grains of salt. Still, from just asking around among my Chinese friends and reading around on forums and such, the overall opinion seems generally positive, and various government officials have clearly said that they think the rules were successful too. Even as an enthusiastic gamer myself, I do think that excessive gaming is a real problem that can lead to pretty terrible consequences. I remember having a roommate in Beijing who was completely addicted to games, he never left his room, never went to classes basically, didn't really have any friends anywhere, just ordered takeout, didn't even clean his room while I was there for a whole semester, and he just gamed. He was in full zombie mode. Seeing anything like this in real life, in person, it really highlights how terrible things can become. It is also pretty clear that many video games are absolutely designed by trained professionals from the ground up to create addiction, including with literal gambling mechanics. Kids might be particularly susceptible to these designs, and I think it's totally reasonable of parents to expect government to help rein these things in in some way. So I'm not inherently against regulation when it comes to gaming, and I even think that a lot of countries will take a look at what China's doing now, they'll treat it as a sort of experiment, they'll learn what they like and what they dislike about it, and they'll come up with their own gaming regulations in years, if not maybe a decade from now. But I do have some pretty clear problems with the specific implementation that China has chosen. First, China's rules are just incredibly prescriptive and leave very little room for parents or kids to make their own decisions. The government selecting a single hour of a specific day to allow for gaming just feels extremely restrictive, and I don't think it is what I would choose for my 17-year-old if I was a parent. Second, of course, there is the issue of privacy. Tying all gaming activity to a real identity and often facial recognition that is directly reported to the government opens doors to all kinds 
kinds of abuse. But third, perhaps my biggest reservation about these new regulations is that they're completely focused on fixing the sort of visible surface level problem instead of trying to fix the thing that causes that problem in the first place. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so treat the next few sentences with that context, but here's what I mean. From what I've read, a significant percentage of experts have actually questioned whether gaming addiction is even really a disorder in the first place, or whether it is more a result of another underlying disorder or issue, such as ADD, depression, anxiety, autism, etc. Patients often have problems like these first, that then cause them to seek relief in something else, for example, in gaming. And similarly, many typical traditional Chinese societal and cultural norms might push people towards gaming as well. From extremely high educational and work expectations to often very limited opportunities for self-expression and few options to let loose or have fun in other ways, the life of Chinese kids makes gaming and even excessive gaming seem like a particularly attractive way to escape. Just as an example, when I was an exchange student in a Chinese high school, my classmates were in school until 9 p.m. every weekday, and then again until 6 p.m. on a Saturday, and then they attended tutoring for maths, English, piano, chess, and who knows what else outside of that. They typically were not allowed to date, they definitely did not go to parties, most of them didn't have any hobbies to speak of, or at least no time for them if they had any, many of them didn't even have cell phones. I mean, as a 16-year-old living under all this pressure, I think I'd be very attracted to video games. And so I feel that while regulating video games is probably justified overall, I also think that that would have to go hand in hand with also trying to fix the problems that led to the addiction in the first place. A more open approach to tackling mental health problems which are traditionally swept under the rug in China, a rethinking of the often very strict parent and child relationships, and of course also taking a long hard look at the country's incredibly competitive education system for example. Now you might have actually heard that the Chinese government has actually started to doing some of that by cracking down massively on its own private education industry too. In 2021, the country's leadership launched a crackdown on what it called excessive educational pressures, which turned out to be even more violent than its crackdown on video games. And I've made a whole second video explaining the education crackdown and its impact that you can watch right now exclusively on Nebula. Nebula is our very own video streaming service where you can watch dozens of exclusive videos like this one from me, as well as bonus content like expert interviews that I do for my research. And of course, all of my regular videos that even typically come out a few days earlier then they go live on YouTube too. It's like Tech Altar Plus, except I'm not the only one doing it, not by far. Nebula was built and owned by a bunch of my favorite educational creators who all do the same. From Wendover to Not Just Bikes, Mustard to Gerald Undone and more, it's all the people who make the smartest content online in one place, with no ads, early access, bonus content and more. Now usually the option that I recommend for a subscriber is a yearly plan for $30 a year, which I think is probably still the best value for most viewers as it includes a $20 discount if you use my link to sign up. But right now in September we also have another option for the people who want to go all in. During September, you can also choose to get a lifetime membership for Nebula. This one costs $300 and it lasts for as long as you and Nebula exist. The idea here is that we want to turn Nebula Originals into even bigger and more ambitious projects, and we also want to roll out many improvements to the platform, and lifetime subscriptions, where you pay upfront, lets us do those things now instead of having to wait for them. So the lifetime membership is all about support for more content and for the platform. Whichever subscription you choose, be sure to use my link in the description because that will let Nebula know that I sent you and that it will apply the discount automatically if you use it. I hope you enjoy all the content, I hope you enjoyed the bonus video, and I'll see you hopefully on Nebula. Bye!